I would like to say welcome to our first speaker at the Athenaeum Symposia. We are delighted to have you here. We're delighted, uh, by the way, this is the Athenaeum Symposia, is the speaker series sponsored by the Humanities, Social Science, and Education Division. And um, I am Joan Nake, the Acting Dean of Humanities, Social Science, and Education. And we'd like to welcome the students, because without the students, Montgomery College would not exist. We'd like to welcome the faculty, because without the faculty, who are individuals who inspire our students to fulfill their potential, Montgomery College would not exist. And we'd like to welcome any community members because the community supports Montgomery College and we support the community through our educational curriculum and through programs like this. You have the flyer so you know what the other two uh, speakers or events are for the fall and we'll have another wonderful series in the spring. Uh, I was asked, uh, actually by uh, Dean Latimer over there, who's hiding in the corner, uh, if I would define Athenaeum Symposium and why we chose that title. So I would just like to tell you why we chose Athenaeum Symposium. First of all, Athenaeum is the temple of, was in ancient Greece, the temple of Athena. And it was the temple of learning and education and teaching. And of course, since she is the goddess of wisdom, that seemed to be very appropriate. But that was in ancient Athens. Today, the word Athenaeum denotes an institution such as a literary club or a scientific academy whose purpose is the promotion of learning. And so that's why we have Athenaeum, but that reflects the place, an institution or an academy of learning. However, the word, since the word Athenaeum only covered the place, we selected symposia. Among the ancient Greeks, symposia denoted convivial meetings for drinking, music, and intellectual discussion. I'm sorry we're not offering the drinking. <laughs> Today, symposia denotes a conference or a meeting in which experts express their views on academic topics or a social problem. Thus, we have Athenaeum Symposia, an institution or a club which promotes learning through the audience listening to experts express their views on an academic topic or a social problem, which is then followed by intellectual discussion, that is, questions from the audience. And so, to introduce our our main speaker, we have Dr. Joe Thompson, who is chair of the History, Political Science, and Sociology Department at Montgomery College on the Germantown campus. And I am delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Thompson, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. I am, I am Joe Thompson, for those of you who are in my online class. Um, I have a face for online class, so you can see why I do that instead of face to face. Some of you are here, uh, some of you here tonight may think that you will be hearing Ira Berlin or from Ira Berlin for the first time. Well, if you have taken one of my history courses here at MC or taken any course at any institution in this country taught by a US historian who has been teaching and writing and reading since the 1970s, you are already familiar with his work. And that is because every good American historian, myself including, included, has been cribbing his notes for decades. Thank you very much. You've made my job easier. Um, and some of us give him credit. I don't. <laughs> I have led them to believe that I am brilliant. Um, when a college professor in this country, or anywhere actually, talks about American slavery, he or she is channeling a Dr. Berlin, Professor Berlin. So most of you have already been introduced to his work. I am here to introduce you to the man. Professor Berlin. He earned his PhD from the University of Wisconsin in 1970. Today he holds the title of Distinguished University Professor in the Department of History at the University of Maryland. He is an award-winning writer and editor. His major works include Slaves Without Masters, which I had to read as a graduate student, Many Thousands Gone, which he has signed for me tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, Generations of Captivity, uh, and most recently, and for sale up there at the top of the, uh, 
the, the room. Uh, the making of Africa, African America, the four great migrations. Professor Berlin has held fellowships at Princeton, Harvard, and Stanford, what we here at MC call safety schools. He has been awarded grants. <laughs> For those of you who cannot get into MC, you can try one of those other schools. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Haydell said you would like that. He has been awarded grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and many other institutions and grant awarding institutions. He, is, he served as a consultant uh, to Ken Burns' award-winning documentary, The Civil War. Did you appear on screen? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was trying to remember, but I couldn't. Um, <laughs> Yeah, just, just radio. <laughs> in 1999, the Humanities Council of Washington named him the Outstanding Public Humanities Scholar of the Year. The following year, President Bill Clinton appointed Dr. Berlin to the Advisory Council of the National Endowment for the Humanities. He has served as President of the Organization of American Histories, uh, Historians, um, my dues are in the mail, and won some of our profession, history profession's most prestigious writing awards, including including, but not exclusively, the Bancroft Prize and the Albert Beveridge Award. That may not mean a lot to this room, but it means a heck of a lot to me. As if all of that wasn't enough, and I am reading this just going crazy, I said, I'm going to look him up on Rate My Professor and see how he fared. <laughs> His students say, say of him, with smiley faces, that he's a great teacher, a wonderful guy, and an awesome dude. <laughs> you strike me as that. And he's a Yankee fan, so. <laughs> Tonight, Ira Berlin, noted historian, award-winning, distinguished professor, and awesome dude, will treat us to a lecture on American slavery in a global perspective. So please put your hands together and welcome Ira Berlin. Well, I would like to I would like to thank uh, Joe for that introduction and revealing revealing my uh, my baseball preferences, but stopping there. Uh, <laughs> and I'd like to thank uh, Joe Nate for inviting uh, inviting me here. And uh, this is a pretty awesome this is a pretty awesome uh, place as well. I, I I agree I agree. Nobody's nobody's safety school at all. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about slavery and try to put it in a kind of global perspective and try to talk a little bit about uh, a little bit what we sh what we should know about slavery kind of the kind of the base kind of the the uh, kind of kind of primer for understanding uh, this uh, strange and uh, horrific uh, horrific uh, institution as well the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution in December of 1865 abolished slavery in the United States. In the years that followed, Southern planters and their allies proved extraordinarily resourceful in inventing new forms of labor extraction and racial oppression. But try as they might, they could not resuscitate chattel bondage. Yet, almost a century and a half later, the question of slavery continues to roil the waters of American life. Indeed, in the last years of the 20th century and the first years of the 21st, have witnessed an extraordinary popular resurgence in interest in slavery, which has stimulated this, both the study of slavery and provided the occasion for a rare conversation between historians and an interested public. Slavery has a greater presence in American life now than at any time since the Civil War ended. That intense engagement over the issue of slavery signals, as it did in the, in the 1770s during the American Revolution and the 1830s during the anti-slavery movement and in the 1960s during the civil rights movement, a crisis in American race relations that of necessity elevates the significance of slavery as part of a more general search for social justice. <laughs> 
Now this new interest in slavery is manifested in, on the big screen in movies like Glory and Beloved, uh, Amazing Grace. Uh, it's been followed on the small screen by any number of TV uh, uh, documentaries or docudramas, PBS's Africa in America, HBO's Unchained Memories, uh, WNET's uh, Slavery and the, Making, uh, and the Making of America. They in turn are followed uh, by the presentation of that famous August St. Gordon's uh, freeze of the Massachusetts 54th at the National Gallery. In fact, there's not a major museum in the United States that has not had an exhibit on slavery, and some including the multi-million dollar Museum of the Underground Railroad in Cincinnati are entirely devoted to the institution of slavery as surely will the National Museum of African American History and Culture will soon take its place uh, on the National Mall right across the street from the Treasury Department prime real estate, which will certainly also have a good deal to say about the institution of slavery. Historic sites like Belleville or Montpellier or Mount Vernon in Virginia, Drayton Hall or Middleton Place in South Carolina, the Hermitage in Tennessee, the Decatur House or the Octagon Houses in Washington, Hampton and Sodderley Plantation here at Maryland, uh, that once only told the story of great men and women who rambled through their hallways, ate from fine china, slept on plump uh, feather beds, now include uh, uh, the history of those who were lodged in the basement or the attics, uh, who ate from wooden bowls, uh, who slept in hammocks or hard pallets. Such matters are not simply the concern for the keepers of these uh, estates. Uh, at Antietam, Fort Sumter, Gettysburg, and other famed uh, battlefields, by congressional mandate, that is by law, requires national park rangers uh, to explain the role of slavery in the coming of the Civil War, federal law thus returns those battlefields to their first purposes in order to give, quote, to quote that law, sacred ground be, to make it a site for reconciliation and healing. In the past year, according to the Gilder Learman Institute for the Study of Slavery uh, at Yale University, its existence itself, uh, evidence uh, of this new revival of interest in slavery, uh, some 60 books uh, have been published on slavery. Uh, these apparently are not enough, so the Gilda Learman people have given a $25 prize for publishing yet more books on the institution, uh, on the institution of, of slavery. And to these, we can add any number of novels and texts, children's books, chronologies, genealogies, of course, hundreds of websites, uh, dozens of CDs, uh, at least uh, two operas. Uh, slavery's been on the cover of Time and Newsweek. It's been above the fold in the Washington Post. It's been the lead story in the Sunday uh, New York uh, Times. Uh, and if all of that is not enough, we've got the continuing co uh, controversy over the paternity of Sally Hemings' children. That controversy uh, reminds us uh, how much slavery has become part of our politics. Uh, the last three presidents, uh, men of very different uh, politics and very different uh, temperaments, have all seen fit to go to Goree, that slave uh, trading factory on the west coast of Africa, to peer out the door of no return uh, amid references uh, to Equiano and Wheatley, Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, uh, and denounce uh, the institution of slavery as one of the great crimes of history. Others uh, wished, it was, uh, wished it was so easy. Uh, as the 21st century is a morning, uh, uh, the press and li literally the nightly news presents some new controversy over slavery, and not just in the states of the former Confederacy. In Washington, it's the discovery that slaves built uh, the National Capitol Building. Uh, new Yorkers have found that the entire lower end of the island of Manhattan 
Manhattan is underlaid by the bones of, of slaves. Uh, Philadelphians uh, have learned uh, that a proposed visitor's uh, center uh, uh, to the Liberty uh, Bell uh, uh, sits uh, directly on the grounds where George Washington uh, housed his slaves. Uh, students at Brown University, Yale, the University of Virginia, South Carolina, even my own University of Maryland uh, have uh, discovered that slave owners and slave traders uh, were among the university's uh, founders and benefactors. Uh, with each of these uh, discoveries has generated on its own, its own controversy, those political resonances have echoed uh, on the political hustings and given the litigious nature of the American people in courts and then in legislatures as governors uh, wave Confederate flags, sing Dixie, celebrate Confederate History Month and then try to extricate uh, their feet, maybe their collective feet, uh, from, their, from their mouths. Uh, in short, this is an awkward, painful, often embarrassing, and sometimes damn right, uh, downright ugly uh, uh, conversation that Americans uh, are often having about slavery. And it's a difficult conversation because it remains tangled in the vexed question of race. So let me speak from direct experience here. In the classroom, students squirm uncomfortably, look at their shoelaces, hopefully waiting for somebody, somebody else, almost anybody else, uh, uh, to speak up when the question of slavery uh, comes up. When that voice is often uh, heard, it's not always a, a welcome one because discussions of slavery can explode in angry, often uninformed uh, uh, rants. Uh, these are just the kind of nightmarish classroom scenarios that every teacher dreads, and as a result, uh, most, uh, try to, most try to avoid. But the dangers of discussing uh, slavery and race uh, can also awaken uh, students to a deeper appreciation of both, precisely because of the explosive nature of the subject. Despite the stony silences, uh, students care, just as we care. Uh, they may be uninformed or they may feign ignorance, probably the latter, but almost everybody has an opinion. Hence, an open discussion of slavery can often clear the air and flush out uh, errant ideas. It also provides uh, students with the opportunity to wrestle with complex ideas which are wrapped in moral judgments, or perhaps vice versa. Far cry from discussing party politics in the 1790s or the Jacksonian bank wars or struggles over the tariff. Occasionally, such discussions can even carry uh, students uh, to no levels of understanding, uh, uh, which presumably is the very essence of education. For myself, if some of those discussions of slavery have generated some of my worst classroom experiences, they have also produced some of my best classroom experiences. And personally, I treasure those priceless moments when I've witnessed uh, uh, students' uh, worlds change, and I presume that they do as well. But as it should be, classroom discussions of slavery are simply not a matter of choice not a gamble to be taken at will, but of necessity. Teaching slavery is essential to any understanding of American society, along with any understanding of America's place in the world, and it's for that reason that slavery has left the classroom and is in our theaters and our museums, on our TVs and on our CD discs, and of course, in our politics. And if that's true, then what should we know? What exactly should we know about slavery? What is the kind of baseline, baseline knowledge? What I'd like to do tonight is to try to outline the things that we should know about slavery and which make an intelligent conversation about it and, of course, the allied questions of race possible. Number one. Slavery holds a special place in the history of the United States. Slavery shaped the American economy, American politics, American culture, and the fundamental beliefs of the American people. 
for most of American history, for most of American history, those 400 years uh, between the founding of Jamestown and the Confederate surrender of Appomattox and the ratification of the 13th Amendment and the years that followed, the mainland colonies and then the American Republic were societies of slaves and slaveholders. Most of our history, most of American history is a history of slavery. The American economy itself is founded on the production of slave-grown crops, the great staples, uh, tobacco, rice, uh, sugar, finally cotton, that slaveholders sold on an international market to bring capital into the colonies and then into that young republic. That capital eventually funded the creation of an infrastructure upon which rests some three centuries of American economic uh, success. In 1860, those four Four million slaves in the American South were conservatively valued at three billion dollars. Now that's almost three times the value of the entire American manufacturing establishment, including all the railroad steamboats, uh, carriages, and the, and the rest in 1860. It is seven times the worth of all of the monies in American banks in 1860. It is almost 50 times the worth of the federal budget in 1860. This enormous wealth that slavery produced allowed slaveholders to play a central role in the establishment of the federal government in 1789. They quickly transformed their economic power into political power. Between the founding of the Republic uh, and the Civil War, the majority of the presidents, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Jackson through Taylor, Polk, Zachary Taylor uh, were slaveholders and generally substantial ones. The same is true of the Supreme Court where the majority of the justices in that same period were slaveholders. And of course the Supreme Court is led by two slaveholding chief justices, John Marshall and Roger Tawney. A similar pattern of course can be found in the Congress. And of course we know it's in the Congress that the struggle over the control of the American government between slaveholders and non-slaveholders go on. The men who controlled American politics made the law, which is, was essential for slavery's existence. The founding fathers uh, designed a nation's uh, preeminent law, the Constitution of the United States, to protect property, but in particular to protect slave property. From that first fugitive slave law in 1791 to the second one in 1850, slaveholders had a friend in court as did white people generally. Not only did the slave codes of the southern state incorporate notions of white supremacy, but so did the laws of the northern ones as well. They elevated white over black, both north and south. The power of that slaveholding class, which made that law, and which was represented in the predominance of slaveholders in the nation's leadership, gave a slaveholders a large hand in shaping American culture and the central values of American life. It is no accident that a slaveholder penned the founding statement of American nationality and that freedom becomes central to the ideology of the American Republic. Men and women who drove slaves understood the meaning of chattel bondage as most surely did the men and women who in fact were viewed as property. And if it is no accident that Thomas Jefferson wrote that all men are created equal, certainly it is no accident that the great, the great spokesman for that ideal, from Richard Allen through Frederick Douglass, from Du Bois through Martin Luther King, were slaves, former slaves, and the descendants of slaves. The importance of slavery in American life is manifest. Second, Slavery, as important as it was to the American past, was not simply the product, not simply the property of the United States. Slavery existed from the earliest history of human society as a center of the plantation complex that flourished uh, throughout uh, the Atlantic between the 15th and the 19th century. And even after the formal abolition of slavery, 
even after slavery is officially gone in every modern nation state, of course it continues to exist, and sadly the number of people are, who are slaves who are held in bondage today is increasing. Although modern slavery, meaning since the 15th century, is identified with people of African descent, probably the majority of human beings who ever trod on this earth lived in some kind of coerced labor relationship that we could certainly connect up with the institution of slavery. Africans and people of African descent are only some, and clearly a small minority, of the many, many people people who suffered from enslavement. No people, however we define them by lineage, by nationality, by religion, by color, escaped at one time or another enslavement. enslavement. In world history, slavery is the rule, freedom the great exception. Over the course of human history, men and women were enslaved for a variety of reasons. The cause of modern plantation slavery, however, is singular. The planter's nearly insatiable demand for labor. Africans are dragged across the Atlantic and were taken to the Americas, not to debase them, to humiliate them, to degrade them in the eyes of white people, although it would certainly do all of those things. The purpose of plantation slavery was not to elevate white over black, although slavery serves that function as well. Rather, slavery's purpose was to make some white people very, very rich and very, very powerful. And for that reason, slavery, whatever its various effects, was first an institution of class exploitation and only secondary an, ex an, ex an institution of racial exploitation. Number three, wherever and whenever slavery had existed, it rested upon a great contradiction, for slaves were both human beings and they were property. In denying men and women the essence of their humanity, that is their volition, their ability to make a choice, made slavery a logically impossible relationship, what one Spanish legal code calls against natural, against natural reason. Throughout history, that contradiction remains at the heart of the slave relationship. It manifests itself in every aspect of slave life, from the public prosecution of slave criminals, men and women without volition, denied volition, men and women denied volition, who are then dragged into, who are then dragged into court to be punished for some willful violation of the law. How could people without volition violate the law? Or to the most intimate relationships between slaveholders and slaves, because surely there was no pleasure to be gained in having sex with a slave if a slave was simply furniture. Whatever made slavery valuable to their owners was that slaveries had will of their own. They could make choices, they could learn, they could improve themselves, and of course, they did. Slaveholders appreciated this fact, and they encouraged their slaves to become better workers, better artisans, better craftsmen, better servants, better laborers. Yet the more valuable the slave became, the greater the slave's worth, and the more adamantly slaveholders pressed for their claim and ownership, insisted that slaves were in fact property, that is furniture, and that their rights to property in human beings was sacrosanct. Moreover, if educating slaves by training them in a trade or allowing them to gain knowledge of a landscape or securing a modicum of literacy increased the value of slaves, it also, of course, made the slave more dangerous, increasing both the slave's desire for freedom and his means for securing it. That contradiction between the slave as person and thing is essential in the slave relationship and is another part of what we have to understand about slavery. 
The contradictions upon which slavery stood manifested themselves in a whole variety of ways. Slavery rested, its, uh, rested upon violence and the willingness of slave owners to use force to bend slaves to their will. Slavery was a killing machine. It murdered, it mutilated, it traumatized, it demeaned millions of men and women. Mean, nasty, heinous, violence that denied human beings the essence of their humanity, that excluded them from participation in society, that left them in a perpetual state of fear was an essential element of the institution of slavery. It could not exist without violence. Without a monopoly of force, backed usually by the power of the state, slavery would collapse. When Toussaint's, when Toussaint's legions or the Union army arrived on a plantation, the game was over. The master's monopoly of violence was broken. Everybody knew it, and that was it. But while slavery killed and mutilated and traumatized and demeaned millions of people, enslaved people never gave in to that process of dehumanization. While slavery was death, slavery was also life. They refused uh, to be dehumanized, in short, by dehumanizing treat treatment. And the history of slavery was not only the history of victimization, was not only the history of brutalization, was not only the history of exclusion, on the narrowest of grounds, in the most difficult of circumstances, enslaved people created and sustained life in the form of families, churches, associations of all kinds. These organizations, often clandestine, sometimes fugitive, always fragile, unrecognized by the larger society, became the site of the creation of new languages, new aesthetics, philosophies, expressed in story and music and dance and cuisine. They produced leaders, they produced ideas that countered the, the culture and ideology of the slaveholding class, the slaves' oppositional culture Culture continues to inform American life, so much so that it's almost impossible to imagine American culture without the creative input of slaves and the legacy of that creative input. So what makes slavery so difficult for us to understand and to comprehend is that embraces two conflicting ideas, slavery as death and slavery as life, that are each are equally compelling and equally true. One states that slavery is one of the great crimes of human history. The other, that men and women transcended that crime and created something new, perhaps grew stronger, be, grew stronger before it, and made slavery one of the great sites for human creativity. In short, slavery made humanity. At the same time, it makes death. It speaks on one hand to our greatest nightmare, the nightmare of chattel bondage, the nightmare of human beings being reduced to a thing, and it speaks on the other hand to that hard-earned, life-affirming legacy of the slave's creativity. Both elements of slavery's history are essential to tell the story of slavery. On one hand, if we leave the kind of soul-breaking violence out of the history of slavery, slave, the history of slavery becomes an empty vessel without weight or without meaning. It's dismissed. It's a giant fraud. It denies the suffering of millions and millions of people and their struggle to create life in the most difficult of circumstances. On the other hand, if slavery is only the history of the murders, the mutilations, the denials of humanity, if it fails to recognize what the slaves created in these most difficult of circumstances, then the story of slavery is equally a hollow charade. It ignores the great struggle of enslaved peoples, what they created at great cost. So to tell the story of slavery, we must tell those two opposite stories and tell them both at the same time, tell them both simultaneously. 
Doing so presses up against the kind of Mankechian urge to tell one story at the cost of the other story. But keeping both balls in the air is essential to slavery's history. Six, slavery was an institution of power. Slaveholders labored to break the slave's will, to make enslaved people an extension of their own person. Slaves refused to bend, asserted their own autonomy and independence, demanded and ultimately maintained their own humanity. In this struggle, slaveholders who would claim the title of master enjoyed enormous advantages, so much so that slavery is sometimes characterized as an institution of total domination. And indeed, whenever we want to think of an institution of domination, wage slavery, an institution of slavery, an institution of domination, the slavery of sex to explain women's position uh, in, in society. We reach for slavery as the model of an institution of domination. But slaves themselves are never without power of one sort or another, even if this power is in tiny little mites. Slavery was thus not an institution of domination, but it becomes an institution of negotiation. Those negotiations, of course, are not on a level playing field, as sometimes claimed uh, exists uh, in a, the fictions of American courts, but negotiations among profound unequals. Understanding that people with little power and no independent standing in the law were able to work their wills is to understand something about the institution of institution of slavery. How do people with little power bend people with great power to their wills? That's essential to understanding something about slavery. Number seven, because the circumstances of negotiation between slaveholders and slaves were always different, slavery itself was always different. Slavery changed over time and it changed through space. It depended upon the terrain of enslavement, that is questions of geography. It depended upon the nature of the population, the balance of numbers between master and slave, between white and black, between men and women, between adults and children, in other words, demography. Uh, uh, it depended upon the nationalities of the slaves, uh, Igbos, Congos, Angolans, mandates, or the nationality of the master, English, French, uh, Spanish. It depended upon their standing, whether they were Africans or whether they were African Americans. Uh, and these are just some of, the, some of the variables which determine the nature of slavery. These endless permutations meant that slavery took different forms uh, in different places, and those forms were constantly, constantly changing. The differences meant that slave societies whatever their essential commonalities can be only understood as historical creations and only understood as changing as history always does. Number eight, like every other human being that ever lived, the slave was a product of his or her circumstances. Only one part, be it a significant part to be sure, was that he or she was owned. Among the other attributes uh, that slaves uh, that slaves had, that they were husbands and wives. Even in the absence of legal standings, they were parents and children. They were skilled or unskilled. They were field hands or house servants. They were Christians or Muslims. They were Methodists or Baptists. Knowing in short that a person was a slave does not tell us everything about him or her. Or put another way, slavery severely circumscribed the lives of enslaved people, but they never fully defined them. The slave's history, like all of human history, was made not only what was done to them, but also what was done by themselves. What were the circumstances that shaped the lives of slaves in the United States? Americans generally point to three. Cotton, black belt residents, 
Afro-Christian religion. Although for most of slavery's history in mainland North America, very few slaves grew cotton, very few slaves lived in the Deep South, and very few slaves embraced Christianity. In other words, we read the history of slavery backwards from the point of emancipation in the middle of the 19th century, forgetting that there were some two and a half centuries of slavery before that, during which the history of slavery was radically different than at that moment of emancipation. Perhaps this is a tribute to the anti-slavery movement and its ability to shape uh, popular understandings of the history of slavery or the enormous weight that the Civil War has in the American man, uh, imagination, but it's a disservice to the experience of slaves and to us, their descendants, who are left to wrestle with slavery and its legacy of racial injustice. Finally, finally, slavery insinuated itself into every relationship, every institution, every action in a slave society, and American society is no exception to this. While the slave and the master stood at the center of these societies, no one was untouched by the presence of the institution of slavery. The relationship between master and slavery, master and slave, deeply affected the standing of white and black non-slaveholders, as it affected the, the relationship between slave masters and the slave master's wife, and the slave master's wife and their children. It affected the relationship uh, uh, between free workers in that society. It affected the relationship between bosses and, and employees. It affected the relationship between students and uh, teachers. Every relationship in a slave society is affected by that. A slave society's politics, its culture, its economy, its social structure, all rest on the existence of chattel bondage. In one way or another, slavery determines everything from what people ate to the way they make love. No one escaped, no one and nothing. Appreciating these essential elements in the history of slavery like all historical studies, not only changes our understanding of the past, but it also changes our possibilities for thinking about the future. And like all history lessons, it does not end simply the discussion, but it merely provides the basis for a fuller beginning. Thank you so much.